I uh, expressed an interest this summer, and my wife gave me this trip as a Christmas present. It's a sad event, but it shouldn't be forgotten. There couldn't be a more important experience to be able to go with her. I think it will change our lives. Hopefully someday I'll be able to uh, share my experiences with other people. I want to visit the place where I, for the last time I saw my family. It's almost like visiting a cemetery. In just moments, this group of teachers, students, war veterans, and a Nazi Holocaust survivor will begin a journey 60 years into the past. The trip takes them to the outskirts of Krakow, Poland, to the scene of a crime as heinous as it is massive. They're returning to Auschwitz. Right there is a barrack. Eva Kaur has been here before, nine times in fact. Her first visit was as a 10-year-old and as a prisoner. And these, you, you couldn't get close to these barbed wires because they, were high, they had high voltage in them. And as you can see, they have a lot of lamps. I mean, it was lit at night. It, it looked like daytime because they had the guards had to see everything around it. Auschwitz is divided into two camps, the original built before World War II, and a second known as Birkenau, or Auschwitz II. This camp was built during the war, mostly by a slave labor force, and it was here in Birkenau, where Eva and her family were brought in the early 1940s. But I knew that everything I was doing here then might help me survive or might get me in trouble and I would be dead. It was supposed to be like a small city, capable of holding 100,000 people, but it wasn't meant to be a place to live, as the Nazi architects built death and suffering into their construction. Lice and rats were everywhere. In the winter like this, I had shoes with holes in them and no socks. And we had one dress, no underwear, no coats, no nothing. Sixty years after Eva's liberation, the weather was the same. But the group wasn't worried about their frozen feet or the slick ground. They were fixed on Eva as she told the story of her first experience in the Nazi death camp. Dogs are barking, Nazis are yelling orders, there are lights everywhere. I looked around and I thought, where is my mom, my dad and my two older sisters? And I tried to look for them, I couldn't find them. At that moment, an other SS came, pulled my mother to the right. We were pulled to the left. And as I looked back, I saw my mother's arms stretched out in despair. And that's the last time I saw her. Ten-year-old Eva and her twin sister Miriam had been ripped away from their family. Eva and Miriam would become part of Nazi doctor Joseph Mengele's twin experiments, Eva being the control and Miriam the guinea pig. The rest of the family was sent to death in the Nazi gas chamber. It was a lot to take in, but the group from the heart of the Midwest was beginning to understand Auschwitz. Um, this is most definitely the most intense experience uh, I've ever had in visiting a concentration camp. And I'm going to step away now. <laughs> this is the conditions that they lived in. Especially in the winter time when temperatures were below freezing, snow falling. I mean, I had the luxury of standing here and fully clothed with a coat on. No one would have had that luxury this time, you know, 60 years ago. 60 years ago, this is where Eva Kors slept. It was a human shelf, not a bed. Three slabs, one on top of the other. No mattress, no blanket, no heat. Sometimes as many as seven other people would share this sleeping space. It was all part of the Nazi construction, as the close quarters helped spread disease and ultimately death. It's just a very emotional experience, you know. Ten-year-old kids, two-year-old kids, ripped away from their parents, their parents killed, and put in barracks, experiment. It's just way too much to handle at one time.
The group from the heart of the Midwest continues its trip into Auschwitz. Their guide, Holocaust survivor Eva Kor. As they enter the camp, they pass under a curved gate with a seemingly welcoming phrase. It reads, Arbiecht macht frei. Work brings freedom. It's not known if this was meant to mock or inspire. What is known is work didn't bring freedom, but not working certainly brought death. In Auschwitz, there were many instances of death and even more ways of dying. The guide was telling us that this wall behind us is where they would bring families and prisoners, uh, Polish, use the Jewish descent, and line them up and es execute them, gun them down. The mom holding a baby and a little child and father were brought here. The baby was shot first and then the child, I guess for the anguish of the parents, and then the parents were also murdered and a boy had watched from his prison cell window watching that happen. Execution by rifle soon became less popular as the Germans thought it beneath them to get the prisoners' blood on their uniform and shoes. The solution? The gas chamber. I have 16 grandchildren. This could happen to them if we're not careful. That's why we're here. We want people to know about this. As being a person who's going into ministry and, you know, being a Christian myself, um, you know, it, it's tough. Look at those little kids. I don't know how people could do that to each other. It's horrific and, I don't know, I just can't believe how people did survive and why the Germans did this. You hear about it, but you don't realize how bad it is till you get here. Death was one of the only escapes from Auschwitz. But for those prisoners who attempted escape, a terrible death awaited the prisoners left behind. Anywhere from 10 to 20 prisoners would be collected after an escape attempt. All of them would be put into one cell and left until they died. These starvation cells were housed in this underground dungeon. Yeah. It's a testament to sadism, quite literally. It's very difficult to see the places where people fought up sadistic activities um, to kill people. That I can tell you the words, I can tell you what happened, but the meaning will never be gained by those unless you were here at that time. this kind of stuff in a history lesson. In a history lesson, you don't smell the hair. You don't feel the cold. Hair from many victims fills this glass case. It's a museum-type exhibit in Auschwitz. The Nazis would shave victims' heads just before they were put to death. The hair was used to make wigs or clothes. Seeing the little braided hair, I said, I remember my daughter has very long hair, and when I comb it and braid it, it reminded me of me missing her on this trip, and I can't imagine being a parent and having my child taken from me knowing what was going to happen. 200,000 children came to a camp, 600 survived. What is my generation doing, you know, to, to keep going, to ensure that something like this never happens again? This explains how much food or how much ration was allowed for each prisoner. So it says, for example, 600 grams of bread for one day. The Nazi obsession with order and documentation meant even if they didn't care about the people they were killing, they still had to acknowledge their deaths, as illustrated in this letter from the German secret police. It explains that a Polish woman by the name of Stanislava Oleven, Olevnik died on um, April the 21st, 1944. What's interesting is it says here, she died in the um, hospital of Auschwitz and that the body was 
cremated in accordance with what they normally do there and put in an urn and that the urn then is housed in the crematorium. He says, I ask you to please tell her um, family and to explain to them that the urn will not be returned to them, nor will her personal effects be returned to them. It shows the lie that they were trying to perpetrate to make people think that in fact her remains were properly uh, buried or, or placed in a place of honor, which is an absolute lie. It's amazing documentation. I guess you can find these things anywhere, but to see them up front and know that somebody typed this letter is um, pretty overwhelming. The Nazi hatred of Jews, gypsies, and their prisoners of war fed the fire, keeping the crematoriums burning. But when the group visited the crematorium, something unexpected happened. This is the exchange between a German student and Holocaust survivor Eva Kor. It's a very bad part of our history. But you had nothing to do with it. Yes, I know, but it's our history and it's very But bad you are you can you are now making a history for your people that they are going to be proud of it. Let me tell you a few things that you can be proud of. In all the tragedies of the world, and there were many tragedies, the Nazis is the worst. But no other country has ever tried to make up for the, for the bad things that they have done as much as the Germans did. You guys are doing tremendous. You, the young people, have nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, it's always rewarding to come back here for, for me and, uh, and my mother, so it's always, uh, always very special. Alex Kor has been to Auschwitz with his mother twice before. I know that it'll, I can't continue to come back with my mom at some point. I'm going to have to come back alone, and uh, it means the world to be you know, with my mom here. I'm lighting this candle in uh, the memory of my father's parents and uh, one brother uh, that did not uh, survive. I light this so it's I light this candle in memory of the one million children who died in the Holocaust in honor of Eva and in honor of my father who was a liberator. I light this candle for Eva for all the suffering she had to go through as a childhood and also as a grown up the Candles Museum with them and how she's still here uh, seeing what happened. They, they find peace in their heart as Eva has to forgive the childhoods that they had so hard of life to forgive and move on and create a better generation. I like my candle as um, proof that Eva can be a beautiful flower that grows out of a terrible tragedy and is my acceptance to teach this to my students. Thank you. I light this candle today, not only in memory of those who died, but also as a hope for a future generation that we might be able to extinguish hate and learn to love forever. As a second generation Holocaust survivor, Alex will continue to tell his family's story long after his mother cannot. Today the torch has been passed to him. 60 years ago today, the long nightmare of the Nazi regime was over. I was liberated and I was physically free. I accept um, the passing of the torch uh, not only for myself, uh, for my sister, uh, for perhaps other second generation uh, survivors, and for, quite frankly, for all of you here and for anybody else, as my mom mentioned, who is interested and wants to help their fellow man. 35 candles. She made something sacred out of this event and gave us an opportunity to reflect and to, to make a spiritual statement. I uh, have a sense of responsibility, and I, and I feel the sense of responsibility that is a second generation um, I think it's important that we continue to tell the story and continue to remind people about what happened. It goes beyond telling the story. 
because Eva Kaur has more than a story. She has a message. Forgiveness. You are now behind barbed wire. Come on in. Eva and the group stand in the same place Eva and her twin sister stood 60 years ago. This image from the liberation of Auschwitz has been burned into history. And who's standing front and center? Eva Kaur and her sister Miriam. That way, that way, we are going that way. Eva and the group reenact her liberation walking the same path that 60 years earlier led to freedom when another survivor joins the march. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we are free. Free, free, free. 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 Yes, 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 yes. Somebody speaks in Polish. <laughs> Ludwig, the group tour guide, did and served as translator while the man told his story. And one of the German uh, policemen hit my mother's head, and they uh, took me away with them. The stories are similar. Young children ripped from their families, but both Eva and her new friend have outlasted Nazi Germany. If I were a rich man. The survivors dance, celebrating their freedom, while the group looks on. Soon the two learn they have more in common than their shared experience or a dance. I have forgiven everybody. It was pure chance, but Eva Kaur had met another survivor who shared her conviction. I have forgiven the Nazis. I have forgiven everybody who has ever hurt me. Forgiveness, for me, is an act of self-healing. Pride. What can you lose? Only your pain. I don't need pills, I don't need drugs, I don't need alcohol. I can talk about it and never have a nightmare. Because I have forgiven those, therefore I have healed myself. I have given me, myself the gift of freedom. Number one, never ever give up if you have a difficult life. If I survive that, you can survive anything. Two, we all have to work to eliminate hatred and prejudice in the world. It's up to all of us. We have to judge people on their actions and content of their character. And three, please try, forgive those who have hurt you. Forgiveness is nothing more and nothing less but an act of self healing yeah. oh. <laughs> Either and forgiveness. Here, 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 here. The idea of forgiveness uh, is now going to be taught to other people and I think more and more people not only here in, uh, in Poland but uh, uh, around the United States and North America will at least start to consider the idea of forgiveness and, and what possibly could do for them on a day in and day out basis. It's a whole lot easier for me to say and believe that I forgive people around me. Uh, something that maybe wasn't easy for me to start with. I don't want to be a victim and a prisoner of my tragic past. I forgive? Well, I will again answer it, why not? If I can pass on the lessons that I have learned here, the lessons that I have learned since I've been here, then I think that the legacy of Auschwitz and the legacy of the Holocaust will have tremendous effect.